Our story begins in a luxury high-rise apartment in Chicago, Illinois. A man by the name of Curtis Wyatt is awoken by two loud bangs. There is a man in the bedroom pointing a gun at his girlfriend who is asleep next to him. Curtis was terrified. He wondered if he was going to be shot next. He laid still until the man left the bedroom. Curtis rolled out of bed and hid on the floor by his side of the bed which was furthest from the door. The man came back into the room, this time he had a knife. The man began stabbing his girlfriend. In an attempt to save her, he jumped across the bed and tackled the intruder. Curtis and the man began fighting. The fight moves out of the bedroom and into the hallway. After fighting with Curtis for a while, the gunman ran out the front door. Curtis dialed 911. Police arrived, but they ultimately locked down the scene as it was clear that Curtis's girlfriend, Yolanda Holmes, was deceased. Detectives arrive on the scene and immediately get to work. They notice that there are no signs of forced entry into the apartment. As detectives walk into the bedroom, they notice that the room was in complete disarray, like there had been a struggle. The victim was laying partially on her bed with her legs and feet hanging off the side. She had two gunshot wounds to her head and two stab wounds to her chest. There was a revolver laying on the floor of the hallway. It was in multiple pieces as if it had fallen apart. Detectives questioned Curtis at the scene. He was bleeding from lacerations on his head and face. He told detectives his version of events, which was the story I just shared with you. However, as Curtis was telling the story, he was all over the place, adding details in here and there. Detectives didn't believe his story. They wondered how Curtis was unable to hear the intruder enter the apartment. Before any further questions could be answered, Curtis was transported to a hospital for treatment. Detectives turned their attention back to the scene. Blood was found throughout the scene basically everywhere. On the walls, on the floor, and in the bathroom. There was a mark on the wall that appeared to have hair attached to it with blood. This indicated that someone's head was bashed into the wall. In the kitchen, detectives discover that a knife from the knife block was missing. Laying on the floor of the hallway was one side of a pair of wired earbuds. Roughly one hour after Curtis made the 911 call, a man by the name of Kwame Wilson arrives outside the building. He identifies himself as Yolanda's son. Police inform him that his mother had been killed. Upon hearing the news, Kwame became emotional and began crying. By midday, the news of the murder spread throughout the community. Everyone was wondering why someone would kill a well-respected and loved local businesswoman and mother. By all accounts, Yolanda was a great person. She was involved in the community, supported local charities, and provided kids with school supplies. Yolanda owned a local hair salon. She had one child, her son Kwame. She wanted to provide the best life that she could for her son. At the scene, detectives find blood all over the bathroom floor and in the sink. It appears as though someone was cleaning up blood. To determine who was cleaning up blood, detectives speak with their only eyewitness, Curtis. They make contact with him after he was released from the hospital. Curtis said that his relationship with Yolanda was on and off. They had recently gotten back together and were sleeping after a night on the town. Curtis said that he was originally woken up by Yolanda's phone ringing. He heard her talking on the phone with somebody. Shortly after, she put the phone back down and they both went back to sleep. Next thing you know, he was awoken by gunshots. He proceeded to tell the same story he initially told to investigators. He couldn't come up with how the man got in or what he looked like. Curtis said that he was the one that cleaned up afterwards. Detectives asked him why he would clean up instead of caring for his dying girlfriend. He didn't have a good answer. Curtis was standoffish and combative when speaking with detectives. The main question is, if the gunman had just killed someone mere inches away from him, why had Curtis been left alive? Police were unable to perform a gunshot residue test on Curtis as he had washed his hands. Detectives determined that the gun found in the hallway was the gun used to kill Yolanda. Investigators brought Yolanda's sister and Kwame down to the station. They asked them if they knew of anyone who would want to harm Yolanda. Neither of them could come up with anyone. Kwame informs detectives that he believes Curtis was involved. He said that his mom wouldn't just let anyone inside the apartment. Yolanda's sister, Anais, tells detectives about an altercation between Yolanda and Curtis during a party at Yolanda's house. Curtis became upset and smashed a TV during the altercation. Curtis said that he was going to go get his gun. He threatened to kill them. Yolanda's family members called the police. The police escorted him out of the building. No charges were ever filed. Detectives gain access to surveillance footage from the building's manager. At 4.32 a.m., a man can be seen walking up to the main entrance. He puts a code in and enters the building. The man was wearing a hoodie and had what appeared to be a bag of clothes and detergent. At 4.46 a.m., 14 minutes later, that same man exits the building wearing a different hoodie. If this was the man that killed Yolanda, why did Curtis wait an additional 15 minutes to call 911? And how did this man get inside Yolanda's apartment? 
The other man in the footage was confirmed to be a resident of the building who had nothing to do with Yolanda's death. At the station, Curtis agreed to take a polygraph. The examiner noticed deception on every question he was asked. Detectives analyzed the security footage more. They determined that when the suspect entered the building, he had earbuds in, but when he was leaving, he appeared to only have one earbud in, while the wire connecting to the other one looked to be cut or broken. Detectives now knew that the torn earbud left in the apartment belonged to the killer. The remaining earbud was sent to be tested for DNA. Detectives were left waiting for the results. Curtis, who was the number one suspect at the time, called detectives every day asking if they had found the person responsible for killing Yolanda. Were his calls sincere, or was he trying to see how far along the investigation was? The crime lab processed the earbud and was able to identify a DNA profile. However, the profile did not belong to anyone in the National DNA Database. Detectives also received results back from the blood found in the hallway. All of the blood belonged to Curtis. Yolanda's blood was only found in the bedroom. This backs up Curtis's story, as it is unlikely that he would injure himself to that degree in order to stage the scene. With no other evidence from the killer, the case begins to go cold. Twelve months after the crime, detectives received the phone statements of Yolanda and Curtis that they had requested months earlier. From those records, detectives determined that Yolanda had two phone numbers under her name. On one of the phone lines, there was a lot of activity before, during, and after the murder. Investigators know that the second phone was not being used by Yolanda because someone was using it while Yolanda was being killed. Detectives must determine who had the phone and who that person was talking to. Detectives attempted to contact Kwame through the phone number he gave them. Them. They were unsuccessful in getting a hold of him. Detectives realized that the number Kwame gave was the same number as Yolanda's second phone line. This means that the person using the phone on the night of Yolanda's murder was Kwame Wilson. Detectives were able to trace the number called on the night of the murder back to an individual named Eugene Spencer. Eugene at one point lived upstairs from Kwame. Eugene also had a criminal record. Yolanda's family had lost contact with Kwame and did not know where he was. Detectives sent out an investigative alert for Eugene and Kwame. This alert would pop up if any police ran Kwame or Eugene's details or their vehicles. An officer spotted Kwame and his car broken down in an alley. The officer ran his information, saw the alert, and brought Kwame down to the station for questioning. Detectives asked him about the second phone number on Yolanda's account. He indicates that that phone number was his. Detectives told him that multiple calls were made to a Eugene Spencer. Kwame denied knowing Eugene, the man who had lived upstairs from him in his grandfather's building, of which Eugene was the only other resident. Detectives called him on his statement. Kwame now says that he knew the man and that the name he called him by was Boo. Detectives show the surveillance video to Kwame. He responds, I know you guys already know, that's Boo. They actually did not know who the man was in the surveillance video. Kwame just told investigators that he knew the man who killed Yolanda. Detectives ask Kwame how the offender got into the building. Kwame responds, Man, it was supposed to be a robbery. He said that he loves his mother and that he wouldn't do anything to harm her. Kwame said that he was scared of Eugene and that Eugene was the one calling all of the shots. Chicago PD began a search for Eugene. He was quickly located at a family member's residence. He was taken down to the station and placed in an interrogation room. Eugene said that when he went inside Yolanda's apartment, a man tried to kill him. The man he was talking about was Curtis. No one knew that Curtis was going to be there. Curtis and Yolanda had broken up months before. Detectives ask Eugene who shot Yolanda. He said, I'm not gonna lie to you. He then admits to shooting her in the head and stabbing her in the chest. Eugene drops a bombshell on investigators. He states that he used the code Kwame gave him to call up to Yolanda's apartment. When Yolanda was on the phone minutes before she was killed, she believed that she was buzzing in her son. Kwame had told his mother about 40 minutes earlier that he was coming over. The real mastermind was Kwame Wilson. He was the one who set up this murder. Detectives question Kwame again. He tries to minimize his involvement. He reluctantly states that he provided Eugene with the gun. Kwame had also provided Eugene with a laundry bag and detergent to make it seem as though he lived in the building. Kwame reveals a third person involved, his girlfriend, Loriana Johnson. Believing that this was strictly a robbery, she drove Eugene to Yolanda's apartment at Kwame's direction. That morning, Eugene entered Yolanda's apartment with the gun that Kwame gave him. He proceeded to shoot Yolanda twice in the head. The room was dark, so he didn't see Curtis laying next to Yolanda. While the murder was occurring, Eugene was on the phone with Kwame the entire time. Kwame told him, make sure that bitch is dead. So Eugene went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife from the knife block. Meanwhile, Curtis was woken up by the shots. He remained still until he saw Eugene leave the room. He then rolled off the bed and onto the floor and hid. Eugene states that he went back to Yolanda's room and proceeded to stab her three to four times in the chest in order to ensure that she was dead. While Eugene was doing this, Curtis jumps out and tries to save Yolanda. 
They get into an altercation. Curtis sustained bad head wounds during the fight. Curtis's head was slammed into the wall and also struck with the gun. Curtis was hit so hard with the gun that it fell apart. So when Curtis washed his hands before making the 911 call, he had just woken up after being bashed in the head. He made the 911 call when he regained consciousness, about 15 minutes after Eugene left. Loriana, Kwame's girlfriend, was waiting in the car for Eugene to return. He returns in a different hoodie, but was still carrying the laundry bag and detergent bottle. Eugene said that Kwame offered him $4,200 to kill his mother. After the deed had been done, Kwame only gave him $70. Kwame's motive for having his mother killed was pure greed. Kwame wanted the life insurance money, the business, and her car. He had recently lost his job, and his career as a rapper was not going well. He had an image to uphold. He was the up-and-coming rapper. Yolanda's family informed detectives that after Kwame received the life insurance money, he began living lavishly. This could be seen through his many social media posts. He was buying cars, living in a condo. He made a video where he was throwing the money he got from his mother's murder to his fans. Yolanda gave him everything, but in this case, nothing was ever enough. On December 24th, 2013, Kwame was arrested for the murder of his mother. Curtis was cleared of any wrongdoing. For over a year, people in the community were pointing the finger at him. In January of 2014, Kwame Wilson is convicted of first-degree murder and is sentenced to 99 years in prison. Eugene Spencer is convicted of first-degree murder as well and is sentenced to 100 years in prison. Loriana Johnson pled guilty to robbery and served seven years in prison before being released on parole.